I'm not exactly sure how many years, months, weeks, days, hours, minutes and seconds you have left on this earth. But let's assume that it's a finite period of time because actually it is a finite period of time. So here's my question for you today. In that finite period of time, how are you going to spend it? What, what are the priorities? What's your purpose? And how are you going to spend the rest of your life here on this earth? Hi, I'm Burning Diamond, and welcome to Christianity Works as we head into the fourth and final message in this series of messages that I've called A New Year, A Fresh Start. Because we're at the beginning of another year and, and it's worth thinking about, well, am I going to live my life the same as I did last year? Am I going to make the same mistakes? Am I going to do the same things? Or am I going to do some things differently this year? See, many people fall into the same routine, the same patterns. Of course, we have New Year's resolutions. And, and right about this time of year, I can hear all these clanging and smashing sounds as all these resolutions come crashing down and dropping on the floor. Because most New Year's resolutions by this time are all over. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to spend more time with my family. I'm going to um, stop smoking. I'm, you know, I'm going to exercise more. All these New Year's resolutions are made every year. And you know, you go to New Year's Eve parties and someone says, I'm going to, this year I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But we, we never actually end up doing them. And you know why? Because entrenched patterns of behavior are very difficult to change. We're, we're creatures of habit. We buy the same brands at the supermarket. We walk the same way to work. We go to the same job. We do the same things. This happens, we react the same way. Are you going to live your life the same this year as you did last year? Because that question that I raised at the beginning, how are you going to spend the rest of your life, is a really poignant one. I don't know when I'm going to die. You don't know when you're going to die. It could be 50 years time. It could be tonight. It could be when I walk out of this studio, I could be run over by a bus. I simply don't know when I'm going to die. My time on this earth is limited. Your time on this earth is limited. How are you going to spend it? What are you going to do? When you get to the end of your life, do you want to look back on a life of, of, of satisfaction? Do you want to look back on a life where you had an impact in people's lives? Or do you want to look back on, on a set of wasted opportunities, on a life where you think, well, if only I'd done this, if, if only I'd tried that, if, if, if only. That sort of sense of regret on my deathbed is something that I want to avoid at all costs. Last time I was here in the studio recording a, a program, um, I went um, for a meal afterwards and uh, the cafe owner saw that I was all dressed up and he said, oh, you're going out, Bernie? I said, no, I've, I've just come back. As it turned out, it was breakfast. I tend to, to shoot these programs fairly early in the morning. And he said, man, Bernie, look at you. I mean, it, here it is. It's nine o'clock in the morning. Um, you've been in the studio for five hours and, and you're not going to die wondering, are you? And I thought, no, I'm not going to die wondering. I love doing what I do. I've been called by God to do something and I just love to do what I've been called to do. The first 36 years of my life, before I met Jesus, before I gave my life to him, I was off doing all stuff for myself. And if I had been on my deathbed at age 37, I would have regretted the fact that I hadn't done anything for other people. And I hadn't done anything for God. See, we just put stuff in our diaries. I don't know about you, I have a diary. My diary is cram-packed full. I have it on my, uh, on my tablet computer here. and It's on my phone, it's on my, my desktop back at the office. And I look at my diary each week and there's so many things in my diary. We just put stuff in our diary. How do you decide what you're going to put in your diary? How do you decide what you're going to do today and tomorrow and, and next week? By what measure do you choose the things that you're going to do and the things that you're not going to do? 
remember once, and my diary has always been busy and full, quite a few years ago now, I had a very full diary for the next few weeks. Back then it was a paper diary. And all of a sudden I became very sick and I ended up in hospital for two weeks. And let me tell you, all of a sudden, all the things that I was thought were so incredibly important became completely irrelevant because I was in hospital, in a bed, with a drip coming out of my arm and monitors all over me, and, and I couldn't do any of them. They, they became irrelevant to my life. Everything just had to stop. And do you know something? There wasn't a sort of a warp in the space-time continuum. The world didn't stop. The, the, the sun came up the next morning. The world didn't depend on Bernie doing all the things that he thought was so important to do. The same is true of you. Take that one step further now. One day I'm going to die. And I'm hoping that I'm going to die and I'll have still things in my diary that I wanted to do and, and plans that I wanted to, to see come to fruition. I hope not to have to slow down. We all slow down when we get older, but I'm hoping that that won't be the case. But one day when I die, the things that I'd planned for tomorrow and the next day will be so completely irrelevant that words can't express it. So we put this stuff in our diary. We, we make our priorities. We, we make our bed and we lie in it. And, and what I'm challenging you today about is why are you doing the things that you're doing? Are you being driven by the day-to-day, -day, the urgent things? Or are you standing back and looking at the big, big picture and saying, well, you know what? I'm doing these things because I believe God has a call on our lives. The Bible says that we have been bought with a price, and that price was the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And therefore, we're not our own, but we belong to God. So if you believe in Jesus, you've been bought with a price. You belong to him. He loves you, and he wants you to live your life by his priorities, not yours. A lawyer came and asked Jesus once, Lord, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment, and the second one is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let me ask you something. What if, what if you and I took that to heart? The single most important commandment, according to Jesus, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the first and the greatest commandment. The second one is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. What if that became the measure by which we choose the things that we do and the things that we don't do? How would your life change? How would your priorities change? How would the things that are in your diary change? I tell you what, when I took this to heart, and I don't do it perfectly, I wish I did, I can't, I can't tell you I do it perfectly, but when I became a Christian and took this to heart, it changed everything. For me, God's call for me was to use the gift of, of storytelling and speaking that I have to do what I'm doing now, rather than to prance around at information technology conferences around the world and earn a lot of money doing it. For me, it changed my priorities. I no longer lie in bed on Sunday morning. I spend time worshipping God. I have a different job because of these priorities. Now, we're not all called to different jobs. We're not all called to be in full-time ministry, praise God. Uh, not everyone is. But I can tell you that when you take Jesus' words to heart, it's going to change your priorities. You see, when we believe in Jesus, we get a new purpose. And that's what I want to talk about today, a new purpose that God has for your life. Because if your life is just drifting along, doing the same old, same old, same old, day after day, week after week, month after month, then one day you're going to get to the end and look back and say, what if I'd followed that dream that Jesus put in my heart? What if I'd taken that job that I thought was a bit risky, but I really felt that God wanted me to do? What if I had done that? Please do me a favor. Please don't live a life of what ifs. Please don't get to the end of your life and, and look back on your life with a whole bunch of regrets. Because God 
has a purpose for your life. And your purpose is to love him with all that you are, with all that you have, with all your hopes and with all your dreams. And to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, to serve the people around you. That's the purpose. That's the plan that God has for your life. Even though your gifts and your skills are entirely different to my gifts and my skills. I do what I can do and, and, and you do what you're gifted to do. If Jesus truly has taken a hold of your life, if he truly has filled your heart, then, then what you do with that is so important. Jesus said this. We're going to Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 45. The good person out of a good treasure of the heart produces good. And the evil person out of an evil treasure produces evil. For it is out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. My prayer is that Jesus has got a hold of your heart. My prayer is that the Spirit of God is living in you and changing you. Well, if that's the case, God has a purpose for your life. And that purpose is to go and serve God, to produce good fruit out of a good heart. Come on, don't waste your life. God has a new purpose for you. And that purpose is to shine his love and his glory into this world. Please don't waste that purpose. Please don't be afraid to step out into that purpose. I know that when I was called to step from my secure, um, rather affluent life as an IT consultant into a, an, an ailing ministry that wasn't going so well back at the time, uh, with not many supporters and not much income coming in, you know what? It was scary. It, it wasn't a decision I took lightly, but here we are, you and I sitting chatting about the things of God all those years later, and I wouldn't have it any other way. You know, it's been really hard to be in this ministry over the years from time to time. I mean, it's great fun. I love doing it. But some days it's hard. And some days it's uncertain. And yet that's what God's called me to do. What's God called you to do? What's, what's the purpose of God for your life? It begins with the most important commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. The first and greatest commandment. And the second one is just like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. Now, how's that going to work its way out in your life? How are you going to use the gifts and the abilities and the skills and the resources that God has given you to live out your purpose? Because it's when we live out the purpose of God for our lives that we discover joy and fulfillment. You may notice I'm really enthusiastic about this stuff. I'm not just sitting here droning on. And it's not just for the TV cameras. I'm enthusiastic about living my life for God out there day by day by day. I wouldn't have it any other way. I wouldn't swap who I am or what God's got me to do for anything in the world. And my prayer is that, that you'll stumble on the purpose of God for your life to use your gifts and your abilities and your skills and your resources for his glory because that's where you'll find the joy and the fulfillment and the contentment that you've always been looking for. Friend, this is the very last week that you'll be able to request your free copy of the Life Application book that goes along with this series of messages. And it's been beautifully designed. It draws on the teaching that you've been hearing in this, in this series, A New Year, A Fresh Start. And, and it gives you some life application questions to work through, to take the teaching and to apply it into your life. Because that's what it's all about. It's not about being entertained. It's not about a theory lesson. It's about getting the Word of God into your heart and experiencing the transformation that comes when Jesus gets a hold of your life. It's my free gift to you. You can request it now online, by phone, by post, whatever works best for you. Get in touch with us today. Don't miss out. This is the last week and we'll get this book straight out to you. Be blessed as you receive God's word. Life is full of choices. And these last few minutes that we have together in this four-part teaching series called A New Year, A Fresh Start. I want to talk about a very important thing. So far, we've talked about all the new things that God wants to give you, a, a new purpose, a new spirit, a new life, a new song in your heart. So many new things that God wants to give you in your life this year. But here's the problem. Many, many people, they receive the good things of God and at the first opportunity, when they run into their first obstacle, they turn back and they go, well, you know, it was just too hard. 
Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. Jesus said, it's going to be hard. It's just too hard. I'm out of here. The Bible says this. Deuteronomy chapter 13, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Choose life. So you and I have a, a choice to make. We can either choose the narrow gate and the difficult road of following Jesus, or we can choose the wide, easy road that leads to destruction. Jesus talked about those two options. And many people get so enthused about the new life and the new start and the new creation and the new spirit and all this new stuff that God wants to give us. They go, I'm off. I'm going to follow Jesus. But then all of a sudden it gets hard. And what we do when it gets hard is, is we go back to our comfort zone. And invariably, our comfort zone is the old life that we were living, the life that we had before Jesus the life of sin, the life of selfishness, the life where there was never any satisfaction or contentment or joy or peace, but we go back to that because we know it. I want to encourage you today to choose life for the rest of your life. And I guarantee you that if you choose to follow Jesus, you will suffer persecution. You will find things are difficult. People will ridicule you because you are going in the opposite direction to all the others. But choose life anyway. Leave the old life behind. Listen, Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says this, Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. God has a new life for you. And what happens is when we believe in Jesus, the old person dies and we're reborn. We're born again. Someone said to me once, oh, you're not one of those born again Christians, are you? And I said, well, actually, they're the only kind. Jesus said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. You must die to the old self and be raised into newness of life. The whole point of Jesus dying on that cross was that he would pay for our sins through the death that he suffered because the wages of sin is death. And the whole point of him rising again and being resurrected is so that we could have a newness of life as well. So when we believe in Jesus, we die to the old person and we're raised to a new life. And here it is, so that you too might walk in newness of life. God has a new life for you. And, and you are going to be tempted to turn back and go back to the old life because you know it, because it's your comfort zone, because following Jesus is hard, because going on that big, wide, broad road that leads down to destruction is much easier today than following Jesus through the narrow gate up through the difficult road. I've been tempted to turn back. There have been times in my life where following Jesus was so hard, where following Jesus hurt so much, that I wanted to turn back. And I thank God that there were people back then who were with me and beside me, who spoke to me and preached to me and encouraged me never to turn back. I see way, way too many Christians filling the pews of churches who go along to church as a matter of ritual and habit, but whose lives have turned back to the old way. And they wonder why their life is a mess. They wonder why they don't have any joy in their lives, why they don't have any peace in their lives. Come on. Jesus said, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I don't give the way that the world gives. Jesus wants to give you his peace. He wants to give you his joy. He wants to give you his contentment. He wants to make it so that when you are assailed by everything, his peace will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. There are so many blessings there. There are so many new things that God wants to give you and we still want to turn back because it's all too hard. If you ever find yourself in that place, I want to encourage you, don't do it. Keep going. Keep persevering. God is in that place with you. God is right there with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Yeah, sure, he leads us through difficult things. Right after Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, at the beginning of his public ministry, the Holy Spirit picked him up and threw him in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights to be tempted by the devil. 
He starved for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, if God did that to his son, he's going to do it to us too sometimes. He's going to lead us through the wilderness experiences. He's going to lead us into the dark valleys because it's in those places that we discover the love of God. It's in those places that we discover the faithfulness of God. It's in those places that we discover the joy and the peace that only Jesus can bring. It's really interesting. You remember the Exodus? You remember when God took the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and, and he led them through the Red Sea and through the wilderness for 40 years and into the Promised Land? By the time they hit the Red Sea and God parted the Red Sea through Moses, God had done some amazing miracles. He sent 10 plagues upon Egypt to finally get Pharaoh to soften his heart and let the people go. They had seen amazing things. And yet at the first difficulty, at the first obstacle, their instinct was to turn back. God was leading them through to the promised land. God was taking them from slavery to freedom. Okay, it was a difficult path. But the, what was on show was freedom. God had shown them these amazing miracles and yet still they wanted to turn back. Why don't you come with me now? We're going to Exodus chapter 14, verses 8 to 12. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites who were going out boldly. So by this time, all the ten plagues had been. The firstborn of all the Egyptians was killed. Pharaoh had let them go. The Israelites were fleeing Egypt, but the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the Israelites who were going out boldly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, his chariot drivers and his army. They overtook them, camped by the sea, near a, dip, near a place whose name is difficult to pronounce. And as Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there weren't enough graves in Egypt that you have taken us to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is not, the very thing, is not this the very thing that we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the wilderness. There it is. They got fear. God's already done amazing things. God already showed them that he's in with them in this difficult journey. And yet their instinct was to turn back. And they did this again and again and again. Let me take you now to Exodus chapter 16. The whole congregation of the Israelites set out from Elim. And Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed the land of Egypt. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven on you, for each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, there will be twice as much as they have for the other days, because, of course, the seventh day was the Sabbath. So they're afraid when the Egyptians come after them. They say, boy, it would have been better if we were back there in Egypt. They're afraid when there's not enough food, when there's not enough water. Their instinct is always to turn back to Egypt. They're on their way to the promised land, but they want to go back to their slavery. People, that's exactly what we do. It's exactly what we do. The moment it gets hard in following Jesus, we want to turn back. We want to go back to the slavery of sin. We want to go back to the wide road that leads to destruction. We want to go back to our comfort zone. And you know what? A lot of people do. And a lot of people are sitting in the pews of churches imagining that they're saved. Some of them are going to get a rude shock on that day of judgment. Because they're not living their lives for Jesus. They don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. They're not trusting Jesus with their very lives. See, trusting Jesus, believing in Jesus, isn't just a head knowledge thing. Believing in Jesus is believing in him with our lives. Trusting him that when he calls us here or leads us into that situation or this situation, that when it's difficult, when it's impossible, he'll be there anyway and we can trust him. God has many, many, many new things ready for you this year. He has a new life. He has a new purpose. He has a new direction. He has a new spirit. He has a new song. But you and I sometimes want to turn back. 
And I feel, just as we close this series out now, to caution you, don't go back. Don't desire what the Israelites desired. Don't do what so many other Christians that you know are doing. Don't turn your life back to the life of sin and of slavery from which Jesus saved you because you have been bought at a price. Jesus died so that you could be forgiven. He rose again so that you could walk in this newness of life. And this year is a year where God wants to pour his mighty blessings out on you. Father, I know there are people watching this program today who are going through such difficult times following Jesus that they do want to turn back. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take your word off the pages of the Bible today and write it on the hearts of those very people to give them courage, to give them consolation, to give them hope, to give them strength, and to give them a passion to follow hard after Jesus. Lord, so often we're weak and feeble. We just admit that to you today. But we know that today your word has been proclaimed. We know today that your spirit is reaching into the lives of some people to strengthen them and to lead them forward on the life's journey that you have chosen for them. Thank you, Father God, for your great blessing. Thank you for sending Jesus. We pray all these things in his mighty name. Amen. And may you, my friend, be so greatly blessed as you receive the word of God today. Well, that's all we have time for today. And that indeed is the end of this series, A New Year, A Fresh Start. Next week, we'll be kicking off with another brand new series of messages right here on Christianity Works. Please don't forget to request your free booklet that I've been telling you about, that life application book. It's my free gift to you. And it's all about helping you to lay hold of the amazing blessings that God has for you in your life this year. God bless you. I'll catch you again same time next week. I'm Bernie Diamond and you've been watching Christianity Works. Hey YouTube, if you are blessed through today's message, then click on this button and subscribe to the Christianity Works YouTube channel and continue being blessed and empowered through the Word of God each and every day.